find good people that you can trust that are loyal to you. And of course, you've got to reciprocate that and then lay out, this is what we're going to do. Why do we build teams? Because they're going to be better at it than us and we can't do everything. The water's fine, homie, jump into the deep end, so it you will reap it. We're talking how to start it, how to grow it, how to keep it. Take a deep breath. You are now rocking with Founder Secrets. John Siracus, welcome to Founder Secrets. Dude, thank you. Thank you guys for having me, man. John and I have known each other a long time, and we talk about entrepreneurs organization, decent amount on this show. But you and I met before I joined EO, which we'll talk about later. We met as kind of the first peer group entrepreneur experience that that I had ever been part of, and it and it really helped change the path of my life. So I'd like to talk about that. But before we jump in, we, we're going to start with an icebreaker. We have kind of a unique one this week, and we'll all three answer this. What's one myth about entrepreneurship you'd like to debunk? John, if you're ready, would you like to start or would you like one of us to start? Yeah, no, I'm happy to start. The main thing is that you have to be a certain way. You have to wake up early or you have to be the most organized person. I have met so many founders and so many successful people, and that's just complete BS. Like, it's you got to find out what works for you and make sure that you can deliver. Like, that's all it really is. I know people that wake up late, sleep 12 hours a day, they're unorganized messes, and they have accomplished more than you know, people that are just literally attempting every single hack that that's in the book. So I think it's you know, finding out what works for you and, and figure out how you can deliver. Love it. Flavio, are you ready? There's two myths I wanted, but I think one, people already know that there's not about the idea, but I still hear a lot of entrepreneurs that I, I just haven't found the right idea yet. I want to be an entrepreneur. Everything's ready. I got everything set. I just don't have a good idea. So I think that's false. But then I guess the more pro myth these days, everybody thinks you need grit to be an entrepreneur. You have to like, oh, I don't have to like work till like three in the morning and like just hustle, 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 hustle. That's also false. In my experience, I think luck is the most important thing. Even I think in our last pod, the person we chatted with, there was a actual legislation change in healthcare that really boosted their company. And they just happened to be that product right at the time when that legislation happened. And look, not to take away from him and, and all, you still need a lot of other things, but I think the biggest factor, even more important than grit in the idea, is just being at the right place at the right time and being lucky. Mine would be when, when you know, I started my first company when I was 19 and I was really into the internet, I think I still am. And so I would read early blogs like Joel on Software, you know, Jason Freed, founder or, um, you know, Basecamp, 37 Signals. And they had a profound impact on, you know, I'd read something and I would think, okay, this is the way to do it. Like w whatever I read, whatever the last thing I read was that I was convinced that that was the truth. And and so if it, John, if you wrote a compelling article and I read it, okay, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> and and I was, I was just so malleable and I was so, whatever I read, I just took his gullible. gospel. I was so gullible really. And I kind of ran my whole first business that way. It was, it was really just based on whatever I'd most recently read or, or heard. And, and it, uh, it didn't matter. And I think there's this, the myth is that the, that I'd like to debunk is that the people who are talking online, especially online, the people on Twitter today, the people that are writing all these tweets and LinkedIn posts about how to run a business, I'd probably follow the opposite of their advice today. Like the people that I know that are truly successful aren't very active on social media because they're working. Right. Like they're, they're, or they're with the kids or they're, you know, they're, they're doing shit. I think that if I was going back and I was telling myself something 15 years ago about entrepreneurship and what to stay away from, but just to be aware of, it's that not everything I read online take with, with truth and that there are different paths. You know, we can do different things. Let's jump in. So I, I, I mentioned this. John and I met through a group that you're now in a leadership position of. That's kind of a peer group of, of, for agency owners. Maybe kind of start with that. Like what, what, what is the group about? How did you come to become part of it? And why did you kind of change your, your role or really take a leadership role in it? I think luck plays a part of that, like uh, Flavio was saying. So yeah, I met you in this group. I think we're like the, the first people that were in it. It's for digital agencies, right? Had a digital agency for, for years now. And one gentleman was like, all right, I just want to get some people together. So he sent everybody a book and kind of cold called them. The guy's got to be the cold call king too, man, because he gets through like every gatekeeper uh, I've ever seen. So we organized this group and he was essentially just getting agency owners together where they could just share like what's working for them or what's not working for them, right? And then it was, uh, I don't know, like eight years into it, 10 years into it. One of the gentlemen said, hey, we're not going to throw this yearly event. That's what I like the most. 
times, right? Just, you know, kind of really getting together and um, like two and a half days, you know, some drinks, some food, and just really figuring out like what's the, what the landscape and our industry looks like. And he said he wasn't going to do the event. So I called him up and said, hey, man, that's the part I like the most. In fact, so much so that I'm going to go ahead and throw this event. And he said, you know what? He said, I am sick and tired of this. He's like, why don't you just take it over then? And uh, I was like, all right, rock on. So uh, that's what we've done. It's about 100 agencies that are that are in there. And uh, the main thing that I like or that I get the most from it is perspective. And I think that's something that's just not appreciated enough. Whether it's EO or any of these other things, you're it's not only understanding like, oh, what's this person's trajectory or, you know, what's, uh, you know, what, what is their business like? It's just seeing that the, uh, it's, it's viewing the way that they see things based on whatever it is that you're doing and what they're doing, as well as like what's going on in the market. And to me, that is priceless because you could be freaking out, reading everything that's in the media, all those crazy bloggers and tweeters you were talking about, Taylor. You might think the, the world is falling down, but we sit down a bunch of people that are doing relatively what you're doing. And they're like, nah, this is this is what's actually happening. You create that semblance, that, that balance that's necessary. So you and I met, uh, you're right. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Who was the guy? He was in Charlotte. Jeff Line. Jeff, yeah. So Jeff cold called my office and somebody came in my office and said, hey, you got to go to this event. And I was like, okay. But you're right. Amazing cold caller. That was the first time that I really felt this, exactly what you're talking about. And I think for people listening, it's such a valuable piece because because I you know, been in business for six, seven years before ever meeting another agency owner that I talked to, like you and I talked at, at that event. And that that peer kind of group is is so important. So how, how did you start in the agency world? What why the agency world? What what attracted you to it? How how did what was your kind of journey to get there? Yeah. So I worked for this other marketing firm and the guys that took, I'm not even gonna say a big box retailer, and I didn't even know it was at the time, bought into this really small company. So it was essentially a private equity play. They were really squeezing it. Twenty six years old doing digital, doing traditional um, for markets all across the, the US. Walking down the hall one day, got my whole marketing team with me. And uh, the new CEO stops me and says, hey, there was this mailer late in some town that I can't even remember. I need you to uh, to tell me why. I'm like, hey, man, I'll tell you why as soon as um, you know I'm done with my meeting here. Right? I got 10 people waiting. He said, no. He said, you're going to draw that right now. So I look back at my team. Look back at him and I said, go fuck yourself. You draw it. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. Man, I'm doing working 20 hours a day. Yeah, you know, I'm 26 years old. Dude. So at, that was the day that that I started my agency. And of course, there was not competes and all this other like red tape and whatnot. But what I did there is all right, I wanted to start a company that was completely different than the one I was working for, where it just really there was a lot of love and trust with the employees, not micromanaging. And no, no, no political games. I think um, I've done a done a decent job at that. And the main thing we do is, yeah, it's performance marketing. We build a lot of websites. We totaled it up the other day. We built over a thousand websites. And you still do that today? That's one of yeah, one of the companies that uh, I own. So that's a tell you. Wait, how many companies do you own? right now? Three. Hopefully in two weeks, four. So one is Oyova, which one is Oyova Digital yeah. Marketing Agency that builds websites, and then the other one is the Digital Mastermind Group, which is a conference for agency owners I think it's more of a peer group but there is a conference component to it yeah so there is an event planning event management piece to it yeah what are the other two uh the other one is three hopefully four it's jobs and sports it's a job board online that aggregates all of the sports jobs people pay a fee to get access to uh to those jobs professional sports jobs and sports yeah. wait like I assume not like an NBA player, but like uh, oh, they're eight, brother. <laughs> yeah. So let's say that somebody works for uh, like the Chicago Bears, or so there, there's an NBA. So any of the professional uh, positions that are that are in there, especially when it comes to management, sports management, and things of that nature, C-suite type stuff. Yeah, those jobs will will be on there, as well as some of the, the other lower level jobs. That seems so different than the other stuff. How, how did you get into that? It was a client of ours. And the, we saw the opportunity based on where they were operating the company. I'm trying to say this in the nicest way possible. We made an offer because we believed and were right that we could make it a more profitable company. When was that? That was 2018, 2017 or 2018. Yeah. Can you talk about the fourth one or is that a... Still, I can't talk about that one yet, but it's actually a similar play. So it's based on another uh, client. Now, granted, they're, they, they, they're, they're running this one very well, if luck, because dude, what you said is so true. Like, I mean, it's, it's all about luck. Any business venture I've really got into, it was either 
I was lucky or I was unlucky. <laughs> it's a really unlucky one, but uh, <laughs> more luck than unlucky. So it's a similar play. So it's a, it's a client we've worked with for a long time. There's a reason they need to divest this business unit and everything looks good so far. And we'll see what Wait, So there were other businesses besides the ones you mentioned that you tried and didn't work out? Yeah. Oh, how many of those were there? Uh, three. Well, are you open to share kind of those yeah of course yeah so my first business that i owned was a uh it was a paintball company paintball like the sport paintball i yeah started with a friend that's where i learned just because you're good friends with somebody and they like the same thing you do doesn't mean you guys are going to run a business well together so start this company and then like just he disappeared I mean, just like poof, like we had talked to each other like every day for like you know since we were in like uh middle school and then just disappeared. I realized I did not like the business and I uh, had a good URL and a few other things and set up an online store and uh, we were doing a little bit of business. And it's one of those stories where you tell everybody like, oh yeah, I sold a company. You're like, no, I broke even and got out of that mess. And that's uh, that, that was that one. So I would consider that, I don't know if it's, it's that, that one's a neutral. There's uh, There was another business that was in the healthcare space. There were some positives uh, in that, some, some positive exits, but also some negatives. And it just turned out I was uh, misaligned with some, some business partners. They were just not the most scrupulous individuals. The third one was in the construction space. I tried to, uh, or I did, I started a, um, a company during the downturn to help out uh, my family because they had a construction company. So what I was doing is essentially, um, it's, it's called Remo Renovations. The site's still up, I think, because I just get a couple backlinks off of it. And it was a, a renovation company. And during the downturn in 2008, if anybody remembers, all new construction stopped. So my family were uh, home builders in that what I was trying to do is drive business to them through that. And the same reason my father fired me in front of 30 people is we just don't get along from a business standpoint. So I was like, all right, I'm just, this business is just done. So my dad and I did one deal together and I realized it was not the, what, what the future held. It wasn't going to be an amicable business situation. So I had to then sell off all the other jobs and get out of that business as quickly as possible. Thanks for sharing, man. You know, I think it's important that, uh, first of all, kudos on going on so many industries, you, your breadth of, of like types of businesses and industries, uh, remarkable. And yeah, thanks for sharing because I do think a lot of the picture these days is that everything's successful or they, if you have one successful thing, then everything you touch is gold and investors view things that way. And I think rarely are people vulnerable about it's not all that way. Right. And, uh, it's almost actually you've had three success and three like so it's almost like, <laughs> it's almost like 50, 50 in terms of number of businesses. I, I don't know the scale of them. But I think, uh, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Now, the largest business I've been ownership of got up to uh, to eight million. But I look at this, and maybe it's it's fun, right? Like you get you can get into a knockdown, drag, brawl out fight, but if you come out with all of your teeth and no permanent injuries, you're like, all right, like all right, I'm still alive, and you're you're gonna learn a lot from that. And I think that's a lot about what business is. I, I think people get so hung up on perfection. And they don't, ins the, the number one rule is just don't invest more than you're willing to lose. It's like going into the casino. And when you can do that with your time and you look at it like a hobby, you can, you can have a lot of fun. And the other thing too, is when people know that about you, they're going to try to pull you into as many deals as possible, right? They're like, Hey, I got this thing. I got this thing. I got this thing. Then you have to develop the muscle of really saying no, like, dude, that sounds amazing, but I don't know anything about the steel pipe industry and I don't even know how to begin to sell it. Right. There's not a whole lot I can do there. But when you see this other avenue and you look for the white space and you weigh out the market, you get excited. And sometimes you get really excited and you try to align up a deal with, with partners, whether it's family or, or friends. And that's the things I learned early on that that's not a good fit. I'm, I'm happy. I, I wear those like a badge on. So you mentioned your father fired you in front of 30 people <laughs> you went in yeah. business uh, with, with, with your father. And then you've had partners in some of these other uh, companies. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious, like, how do you choose now, like with, with the wisdom that you've gained through these different processes, how do you choose, you know, I don't want to go in the steel pipe industry, but also what, what are good fits in terms of partners and maybe what, what you look out for now in terms of that's not a good fit. In so far as is partners, I think the main thing is just deep down knowing like who they are as a person and just seeing their track record. Right. And then saying, 
Uh, I think another thing is like, what what is their community impact? And their community impact doesn't necessarily need to be some kind of like philanthropic crap that they're doing. Like, okay, who are their friends? Go to a barbecue with them, hang out with their friends, see what that's like. How long have their friends known them? What is their relationship like with their their wife? What is their relationship with like with their kids? Those are the things that I didn't focus on with a really bad uh, situation. And I should have. Like the guy was awful to his wife, really didn't have a relationship with his kids. The other guy was super charming and super cool. And he's owned num- uh, a number of very successful businesses. But you then see like when you look past it, like, oh, wow, he's actually screwed over like so many people. Like he's... He's there for a reason, and that reason is based on the sweat equity and uh, the you know other people's money that has gotten him there. And it's just all patterns, right? Like, okay, all right. So um, you start putting together these patterns, and then based on that, you can actually size somebody up whether they're going to be a, a good fit. As far as like businesses, the thing that I like the most now, any other business I'm going to do is high margin. That's it. I am no no huge volume, low margin stuff. I have no interest in that. Other people can do that, but to me, it's just. It's it's just a really bad business model, but God bless them if they can do it. Well, why is margin so important in your experience? It gives you room for failure, right? Profit is insurance. It's security. It's 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 what we're all working for. So the, if you can get that in a high volume, high profit space, which very few exist outside of like you know SaaS and subscription based models, that's the ticket. That's what I'm looking for. Not necessarily. It doesn't even have to be a technology play. Like I'm even looking at like some commodities or things like that, and that might be a fit. But profits everything, man. So the more of that you can get, the better. Yeah, you seem to be like really good at I guess sales. How did you develop that? that skill and, and owned it over time. I, I would say I was naturally good at sales because I didn't know anything about it. I think people really need to understand that it's it's an art and a science. And it's 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 a skill. You know, you take the basic measures as are right, you're gonna read everything. But that other marketing firm that I mentioned that I worked for, I had a really good mentor. And this guy was probably one of the most flawed individuals you'd ever meet. Like he had like four marriages and he was an alcoholic and he was like probably a hundred pounds overweight. But dude, I've never met anybody that can charm a room more and, and, and sell better than him. Quick story on that, right? We're I, I'm preparing this huge pres- uh, presentation for a pretty large brand. In that, it's taken me weeks to put this presentation together. We're going to go in there and we're going to pitch for a, for a huge account. And I keep trying to show it to him. He did, he's not checking in on me. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm a self-starter. I'm like, all right, dude, I got this. I got this. I get. Th-. He's giving me no feedback. And then we're literally about to walk into this meeting. I'm like sweating. I'm panicking. I'm, I'm like, what, what the hell's going on, man? And I'm trying to show them my giant laptop, right? Because this is like their early 2000s as I'm, as I'm walking into this room. He's like, hey, hey, hey. And he goes in there and he didn't talk about the presentation at all. He literally just like, you know, made everybody in that room feel special. He painted a small picture of what the future could look like. They all attached to it. And I, after the meeting, I was like, "Why did you use my presentation?" I, yeah, I was just so I was kind of hurt, right? I wanted the the some some credit and glory for for what happened in there. He he said, "Hey, this is a lesson." He said, it, "It's not about you. It's not about all the data and everything that you can put together. It's about you connecting with them and seeing what they can get at what the future holds." So taking like lots of lessons like that that he would give me in a very hard way um, it was very helpful. Hold on. So what did he do exactly to make those people in the room? feel special so he was a very gregarious and funny guy right so he would start a meeting and he would usually crack a joke and usually it would be like something that was self-effacing right just total total humility so in there he gets everybody laughing and then he would have some type of tidbit about somebody whether it was their kids or something like that he would get them talking and once he gets everybody talking he just starts grabbing like little pieces and he creates this conversation and then with this specific deal they were in a precarious situation when it came to the, the future of this company for a certain division of their business. And then he would be, had a sense of the room that it wasn't all about dollars. It was about their people. And then he just starts talking about uh, the compassion that they have for their staff. And he just literally, whatever those like soft buttons were, he would just keep pressing those and pressing those. And then in that, I don't even think he had the vision walking into that meeting, to be frank with you. And then he's like, all right, this this is what I'm seeing here. And then they just like instantly like fell in love. Some people have that. I, I don't have that talent to just go in there and bullshit everybody. I would say in some respects, it was like learning sales from a con artist. 
right? Um, that would be like the most negative perspective of looking at it. But he wasn't the guy who had a good R. He was a fl- flawed human being. But his ability to connect with people, I think, is is the most important thing. Look, for an hour, wait, I can see doing that for five, ten minutes. But if you have an hour meeting when you're supposed to pitch and there's other people pitching, how in the world did he keep that up for an hour? And like, how did it end? So his training was in like seminary work. So he wanted to be a preacher. So, all right, you take the best comics like Sam Kinison or any of those. That guy yeah. went to school to be a preacher, right? So these people, that skill, or even take stand-up comics, for instance. Why are they so good with people? Because they're continually getting that feedback loop from the audience. and They're just con- continually communicating. So it's that type of skill um, that he had. He was amazing at it, man. Like, it was just one of those things. But the most important thing is nobody leaves a meeting and says, I got too many compliments and I felt too special, right? <laughs> So if you do that for 55 minutes and then you paint the vision in, in the five, you, it gets you to the, the next dance. That, that was his, his trait. But what I took from it, though, was, yeah, you know, just connect with them and make them feel special. I love it. Bobby was like, no, I'm not getting this. He's, he's literally. <laughs> he's not. I can see. It's weird. I'm looking for, for where I can take like a seminary course in New York City just to improve my sales <laughs> skills. You, you and I both share a love of stand-up comedy. You know, when people ask me about sales, I also reference stand-up comedy be, be, because I think that part of sales is comedy. Like, like it, it's not telling jokes, but it's the connection that you hit on. You, you know, it's a connection be, because part of what makes somebody funny oftentimes is that they're relatable or that the scenario was relatable. And, and, and that really is building a connection with them in, in a way. And then that's, the, you know, that's what makes you laugh. I think of all the time, you know, especially in these big rooms, I have seen two people who say the same words. They use the same words, but, but one gets this strong, you know, engagement from the audience and the other does not. And I'm curious, like, like, what, what, what do you think of that? Because you, you do get a strong reaction and you also love stand up. Do, do you think that you pull from stand up or you pull from preachers or you pull from those things? Um, when you're doing sales today or how, how did you kind of take those lessons from 20 years ago and apply them to yourself today? Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's definitely learning. Learning from my mentor was a big part of it to, to watch somebody walk into a room and then have a, a whole room full of people crying, right? Because he tells this story, right? You just see that you're like, whoa, like it is just, and it, it's incredible, right? It's somebody that could just really connect like on that Tony Robbins type of level where you're like, the, it's it's just bizarre. But then knowing that person and knowing how human they really are, right? Where they never had a drink until they were 24 and then instantly became an alcoholic the first time they tasted beer. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then just, and then struggling with that their entire life. But you walk into this room and everything's uh, polished. But uh, the other side is, yeah, with stand-up comedy. I say some things that I have some stories that, where I have just completely embarrassed myself by reading the room the wrong way. And just like, wow, that didn't go well. You know? <laughs> Could you share one? That Does one come to mind? There, oh, man, dude. <laughs> I want to say it so bad. I'm trying to think of one I can tell. It just will not get me canceled. <laughs> All right, here's one. Here's one. I, I, I went to a meeting. There was a um, there was like a security guard that was downstairs, and he had this like really like bruised face. I don't know. It, it looked like something happened. All right. So I go into to the meeting. And I was like, hey, who the hell beat up a security guard down there? Well, it turns out he's a family relative. And then he had like a epileptic attack. And then he like passed out, and hit his face on like a toilet or something. And then there's like this sign that's over there that like there's this whole charity event that's going to be for him. <laughs> oh, like. Jeez. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, man. Yeah, so instantly I thought I was making a joke to ingratiate myself to them and I made I don't know enemies. But here's the other part that it has it's which very similar sales is very similar to stand-up comic. There's a lot of rejection. And you can build up a very thick skin. Uh even going back to the day when I would do cold calls, right? I do yeah, you know, sometimes hundred, two hundred cold calls a day. And in that, yeah, you're, you're, you're getting cursed out. But if you're looking at it like a game and trying to have fun and just really trying to connect with those people, it goes a lot further. You have more tolerance for it. Nobody loves it. Let's be real. But you can, you have more patience. It goes from patience to tolerance. You'll be more patient with yourself rather than having to tolerate uh, the externals. Uh, you, so you mentioned how you look at people you partner with to, to judge of kind of based on their personal life, how they're going to be as a partner. I'm wondering, how do you manage your own kind of life work life you know balance and in that personal side 
with these three slash potentially four <laughs> pieces that you're running. I'm going to mess while we are. Ooh, this is going to be my intervention. No, um, I think Je- I think Jeff Bezos said it best. Balance is is not the right word. It's harmony, right? So that that's what I look at. Like when you're trying to like balance something, it seems like it's it's never going to be balanced. But I think like all right, looking at harmony with my wife, and then you know just just my world. All right, there's some times where I'm going to want to work 20 hours a day. There's going to be others where it's I'm going to take two or three days off, and it's just listening to yourself and figuring out what's working and what's not working. Right? Not always looking for uh, are right or wrong in the situations. I think the other two uh, that helps is is tracking. I track what I eat. I get a little bit freaky about this. I track, uh, you know, all of my workouts. I track all of my sleep. Some people call it biohacking. I just call it, you know, good measure. So I think in that, that's what helps me. And then it's harmonious, right? You're listening to the the inputs. All right, I, I need to spend some some time with my wife. Or are you getting the signals? Like, all right, yeah, we we need to go on a quick vacation. That's what I look for: harmony and rhythm. You. Love movies, or you say you do. Love I movies. do. I actually do. I don't just say it. That's a real thing. <laughs> you love it. Uh, so, are there any? You know, you've pulled lessons from stand-up comedy. Are, do you think there are any lessons in movies for entrepreneurships or for, or for those getting started? I'm tempted to say there will be blood as a joke. <laughs> the, the actually the other one, I don't know if it's going to be too far off, but it is genuine. Is the Godfather? Now, granted, it's not making people a deal they can't refuse, and I'm sure you could probably extrapolate something out of that. But I think the main thing is. He builds a team in that, right? That team is family to some extent, but some of it's not. And then there's a ton of trust in that. There's not micromanagement in what he's done, whether you've read the books well and seen the movie. They get shit done, right? It's just like, hey, I'm going to lay out a plan and this is how it's going to, to go. And that's what I like to do. Find good people that you can trust that are loyal to you. And of course, you've got to reciprocate that. And then lay out, this is what we're going to do. And then all you got to do is check in with the conversation and you don't have to micromanage them. I think that's that would be the movie that had the the biggest impact in business building for me from a, from a, a team standpoint. And also, yeah, why do we build teams? Because they're going to be better at it than us, and we can't do everything. I didn't see the Godfather reference coming, but uh, that, that, that's great. You, you went through a merger. You, you, you had an agency. You kind of merged it. Can you speak to the, that process? I mean, that this is very rare for individual or for businesses to go through. How did you make that decision? W- why did you do it? Like any lessons that you learned through that process? The why of it is the economy was roaring so so hot in 2019. If I was going to do that, that was the best time. So um, that, that was a lucky decision. Uh, the other uh, part of that why is it was based on what I was seeing was happening in the in the market. I wanted a, a deeper tech bench. And instead of hiring on all that talent, I had a partner that I've worked with for a long time. So we just made that partnership uh, official. So I think in that, yeah, we had performance-based marketing and then we uh, tacked on uh, development in there, uh, some really deep development shops. And it's proved effective. It, as far as what I've learned in that, I have a great partner, so I think I got lucky there as well. I think the other thing, I'm trying to think of actually a really good lesson that's that's in there. I mean, just find a really damn good partner and, and then in merger. Make sure your cultures are very similar. And then people get cultures, they think, you know, bean bags and all this type of stuff. I think culture comes down to, sorry, what is, what is the way that you guys think about something? And then how do you do whatever that thing is that you're supposed to do? That's the main culmination. So yeah, we, we have a... a a culture of excellence and i think that's the, the biggest lesson is yeah definitely find a partner worth partnering with if you're going to merge but you owned the business 100 percent before and now you have a partner yeah how, how, are, how are you able to kind of navigate that like you see you seem to do a good job of like managing you know relationships with partners but you owned the shop and called all the shots before i assume yep. there was a little bit of a transition to where you, you don't get to call everything anymore so I think the main thing is clarifying, all right, this is how it's going to be moving forward. Make sure that it's a, it's a true partnership where it's not going to be like you're going through like reviews and stuff like that. And then I, I would say that the other piece of it is making sure that it's clear of what they're going to do. I've had partnerships where that was, it was just ambiguous. You think it, the unsaid of them saying like, oh yeah, you know, they're, they're really good at production. So they're going to manage production or they're a finance guy. So they're going to to manage the books and then you partner with them. And then you realize they're like, dude, I'm not a bookkeeper, bro. It's like, okay, well, we want to save as much money here. You know how to manage books. So why don't you go ahead and do the books in this relationship, learning from all these other past experiences, it was, it was very clear. And the, 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 the lines of clarity there, I think it when people can make it brutally simple, I'm responsible for 
driving revenue, he's responsible for making a profit, right? So it's just boom, it's very binary. Profit's down, he's failing. Sales are sales are down, income's down, I'm failing. When you have partnerships like that, it's it's a very effective outcome. When it's ambiguous and amorphous and a bunch of other words that just really aren't going to deliver, then you're going to get yourself into a bad situation. Thanks. Some really, really good lessons there. All right. We'll move into the uh, life hack and uh, kind of wrap things up here. So life hack can be, it could be uh, something you do in, in your, your life and you'll go last. So you get a little bit of time to think about it. The life hack could be something that it could be a tech tip. It could be something that you use on your phone. It could be an app. Uh, or it could be something that is not tech related at all. I can go first and then uh, Flavio, you, then John. Mine is actually a negative life hack and it's what not to do. And mine is don't get blue light glasses. A, I think it's a scam. And B, it, it filters, uh, it makes all the colors. I don't know if either of you wear them or have worn them, but it makes blues, which blue is my favorite color, right? I love blue. And, and I love, you know, I'm looking outside the sky. It's lo- wonderful, right? You put on blue light glasses. Now it's a yellow sky. And it's sad. And that makes me scared. So, so it, sure, the way it filters, it like filters out the blue. Hence the blue light, you know, thing. You know, I got these like nice glasses, spent all this money on them. And now every time I put them on, I'm like, oh, it just dulls my life. And when I Googled it afterwards, I'm not convinced that it actually is helpful. You, you know, that like blocking the blue rays or any of these things actually is Ray-Bans told me they would be. So my negative life hack is at least think and, and do some Googling about the impact of blue light, of reducing blue light would have on the happiness of your life when you can't see good blues anymore. Definitely will make you look like a nerd though. That's a hundred percent. That's true. true. So that's my life hack this week. Have you heard of blood flow restriction training? Sounds kind of crazy. Yeah, you know, David Carradine? Yeah, and it killed some people? Well, I don't know about that, but I just started using it and I'm still alive. And But okay. you should consult your doctor before taking this life back. You know? <laughs> it, and they're basically these bands that you put around your arms and or your legs and then work out with like 5% of the weight you would normally. So very, very light weight. And because of it restricting a little blood flow it doesn't restrict blood flow into your limbs so you're still alive and good but it it restricts a little bit going out so your brain thinks it needs more so it pumps more and it gives the body uh, this impression that you're working out much harder than you actually are now it doesn't fully replace the workout you still need to work out but if you if the way people use this two or three times a week is if say they're injured you know this is i'm getting older i'll avoid injuries and this is a way to to, to mix this in and still get some benefits, but without the risk of injury. That's the BFR, blood flow restriction bands. They're like 20 bucks on Amazon. There's also this- Are they sold next to like blue light glasses? <laughs> <laughs> they come with a free blue light glass. <laughs> <laughs> Yours are all like health related, you know, kind of in some respect. Mine is, I don't know if it's a new life hack. It's something I've been doing. I'm telling a buddy about it the other day and it's, it's mainly for traveling. I do a lot of business travel and I stay in like a lot of Airbnbs. And what I do typically, if there's not like a, a giant conference there where I know all the rooms are going to get taken, I wait till the last like two days and then I begin negotiating with all the hosts by messaging. So you get like five or six of them and you can usually reduce your rate by, I'd say a minimum of 20%. Somebody's going to bite. They got two days. You're going to be there. So I'd say a minimum of 20%. In some cases, I've got it low as 50%. That's my life hack. Like what do you say to them? Hey, look, I'm looking at four other places. Will you take X for it per night? Some of them don't respond. Some of them say, no, it's locked. And then some of them are like, done. Like, boom, out of X. This could be turned into a business. It's like hotel tonight. But yes. for Airbnbs, and you have this like middle, this could be a business. They could? Yeah, not one I want to get in. <laughs> <laughs> you want a fifth business? That was, that was just a test. That was just a test to see if you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it quick. Because when you get excited, then you start, you know, convincing uh, or you know, manipulating the dick. Appreciate you coming on. One one last thing, any requests from the audience? How can people reach out to you? Anything you want to plug? Yeah, if you want to reach out to me, best way is LinkedIn. It's the only social media platform I'm on. It's uh, John Sarakis. I'll spell it T-S-O-U-R-A-K-I-S. As far as plug, uh, the digital mastermind. Yeah, if you're an agency or marketing professional and you're looking to have some perspective of your game, you got webinars, got a yearly event, got uh, weekly calls. Go ahead, sign, go to digitalmastermind.com and uh, we'd love to hang with you. Thanks so much for coming on, John. Thanks, John. Dude, thank you guys, man. This was awesome. Appreciate it. The water's fine.